In anatomy, we have some anatomical terms. First, anatomical position refers to the body as it is standing straight up, looking forward with the palms facing forward. Supine means laying down with the palms up, with the chest facing upwards, and then prone is lying on your chest facing downwards. We have a couple regions, the first being the cephalic or the head region, the cervical, the neck region, the thoracic, the chest region, the axillary, the armpit region, the dorsal or back, the abdominal or belly region, the brachial or arm region, the lumbar or lower back region, and the pelvic region or the hip region. We also refer to the forearms as the antibrachial region and the elbows as the cubital region. Next we have sectional planes. The first one is transverse sectional plane, which is a horizontal plane that divides superior to inferior. Then we have a frontal plane, which divides anterior and posterior. And then we have the sagittal plane, which divides left and right. And then we have some directionality terms. So cranial refers to towards the head and caudal refers to towards the tail. These are usually used in animals with different anatomical positions, such as animals who have all four limbs on the ground. For us, we usually use superior and inferior, superior towards the head, inferior towards the feet. Uh, posterior or dorsal, dorsal refers to closer to the back. Anterior and ventral refers to towards the front. Proximal refers to closer to the point of attachment and distal refers to further away from the point of attachment. So for instance, the shoulder is proximal to the elbow and the elbow is distal to the shoulder. Medial refers to closer to the midline of the body and lateral refers to being further away from the midline. We also have deep and superficial. Deep is closer to the core of the body and superficial is closer to the surface. Then we have some histology. We have four types of tissue we're going to cover, epithelial, connective, muscle, and neural tissue. First, we will refer to epithelial tissue in two regions, first being the apical surface or the exposed surface and the basal surface or the attachment point. We have different kinds of epithelial tissue. They're divided into squamous cuboidal columnar. That is referring to the shape of the cell. Squamous is flattened. Cuboidal is cubic and columnar is elongated cells. Simple versus stratified refers to the layering of the cells. Simple cells are single layered and stratified cells are multi-layered. Here's an example of a squamous epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium, simple cuboidal epithelium, stratified cuboidal epithelium, transitional epithelium. This is tissue that can be stretched. Simple columnar epithelium, with the villi pointed out at the top layer, those are little finger-like projections that allow to increase the surface area. We have pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. This refers to the fact that it looks like it should be stratified in some portions, but some cells go all the way down to the basal surface. So it's pseudostratified and it has cilia on top. These cilia are structures that allow for motility of whatever is on the apical surface of the cell. Here's a picture of stratified columnar epithelium. You can see the layers and you can see that the apical surface is the columnar cells. We always refer to the apical surface as our defining feature, even though some of the cells look cuboidal at the basal surface. Here we have some glandular epithelium. Exocrine glands are glands that release products directly into the body fluids, such as the bloodstream or the interstitial fluid. Exocrine glands release their products onto body surfaces. Next, we'll be talking about connective tissues. There are a couple kinds, connective tissue proper. This is what you might think of as being connective tissue. And then we have fluid connective tissues. These are a little bit counterintuitive. We have blood and lymph being examples of that. And then supporting connective tissues like cartilage and bone. First is loose connective tissue. It looks like this and has collagen fibers going all through the matrix. Next, we have adipose tissue, large cells with large vacuoles. Next, we have reticular tissue with reticular fibers. The next, we have three different kinds of dense connective tissue. First being dense irregular connective tissue. Next, elastic tissue and dense regular connective tissue. The dense irregular connective tissue appears irregular, such that all of the collagen fibers are going in many different directions. This allows for three-dimensional strength, that is strength in all different directions. This is good for the skin, the dermis has this quality. We have dense regular connective tissue. You can see that the collagen fibers are oriented in one direction. This is helpful for tendons, which have stress in a single direction. 
And then we have elastic connective tissue, which has elastic fibers and can be stretched. And then we have blood as one example of fluid connective tissue. It has 55% plasma and 45% of the formed elements, the formed elements being erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. Last, we have supporting connective tissues. Firstly, we'll go over cartilage, and then bone we'll go over on the model. Hyaline cartilage, there's lots of matrix. Not much is going on in the matrix, and the chondrocytes are in the lacunae within the matrix. And we can see in the elastic cartilage that there's elastic fibers going all through the matrix. In the fibrous cartilage, there's collagen fibers going through the matrix. This is an osteon, or a Haversian system. It's a section of compact bone. First, we have osteocytes. Those are these cells right here. We have two kinds of osteocytes. Osteoblasts, they build up bone. Osteoclasts, they cut down bone. And those are seated in the lacunae of the bone. And then we have canaliculi. Those are these passageways between the um, osteocytes. Um, we can't see it on this model, but the periosteum, if this was the outside of the bone, would be the layer surrounding the very outside of bone. And then if we were to have a spongy bone, it would have less dense bone going all through it, and is where the bone marrow sits. Inside the Haversian system, we have the Haversian canal with arteries and veins, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. These layers are called lamellae. There are three different kinds of muscle tissue. First is skeletal muscle. You can see the striations going across the cells from top to bottom in this picture. And these cells are voluntary. That means you can consciously control them. Next, we have cardiac muscle tissue. This is in the heart, and we can differentiate it from skeletal muscle tissue because it has intercalated discs that divide the cells. The cells are much smaller, whereas in skeletal muscle, the cells run the length of the muscle fiber itself. These cardiac muscles are involuntary. Then we have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is involuntary and is usually found in internal organs. And you can see that it does not have striations. This is a model of a neuron. And on our neuron models, we have a little booklet that you can go through and get a little bit more information on it. First we have the cell body, that's this region of the neuron. Then we have the nucleus right here. And then we have the perikaryon, that's this fluid, it'd be like the cytosol of another cell. And we have these blue dots, which are the endoplasmic reticula. Then we have dendrites and axons. Dendrites are carrying action potentials towards the cell, and axons are carrying action potentials away from the cell body. Um, it's a little ambiguous whether or not this is an axon or a dendrite. It could be either depending on the direction relative to the cell body, but we'll call this an axon in this lab. On the axon, we have the myelin sheath. This is this layer. It goes around and wraps it. And we have nodes of Ranvier. Those are narrowings right there. And then in between the nodes of Ranvier, we have internodes. And then right up here again, we have the axon hillock which is where the action potential begins to propagate down the axon. Also on this axon model, we have the paraneural connective tissue. That's this gray part down here. And then over here, we have telodendria. Those are the branches of the axon. And at the end of the telodendria, or the terminal branches, we have synaptic knobs, or synaptic terminals. Those are these enlargements. And then between the presynaptic cell, which is this one carrying the action potential, and the postsynaptic cell, the one receiving the action potential, we have the synaptic cleft. And then we have a couple different kinds of neuroglia or glial cells. In the CNS, these are called oligodendrocytes. And in the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, these are called Schwann cells, the CNS being the central nervous system. And these are support cells, and they allow for the creation of the myelin sheath. This is a model of the integumentary system, or the skin. First, we have a couple layers. We have the stratum corneum or corneum. This looks like two layers, but this, this top section is showing texture. Then we have the stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the stratum spinosum, stratum basale or germinativum, the basal lamina in blue, and the dermal papillae, or these bumps. These layers, up until the dermal papillae, or the basal lamina rather, are part of the epidermis. Everything below that, down in here, is all part of the dermis. And then down here, where the fat is, is the hypodermis, or the subcutaneous layer. 
We're going to turn the model on its side so we can have a better view. We have arterioles and venules. We have papillary plexus, that's this right here, vasculature and nerves going into the dermal papilla. Then we have nerves, which are these yellow structures. And we have tactile or Meissner corpuscles, tactile tomatoes, they kind of look like tomatoes. And then we have lamellated or piscinian corpuscles. Those are these guys that kind of look like watermelons, watermelamellated corpuscles. And we have pore of sweat gland. That's where the sweat gland comes to the surface of the skin, right there. That would be the pore. And then we have apocrine sweat glands, which are these green guys. These secrete via miracrine action, so don't be confused. And then these are miracrine sweat glands to make things even more confusing. And the miracrine sweat glands are also called exocrine sweat glands. And lastly, we have a sebaceous gland, which secretes sebum onto the surface of the hair. Next we'll be talking about the hair, which is this guy, in these three places. First we have the erector pili muscle, and this is what gives you goosebumps, it raises the hair. We have the hair root, this is the part below the sebaceous gland, the hair shaft above the sebaceous gland. The hair follicle is the organ responsible for producing the hair. We have the hair bulb, that's this enlargement at the bottom of the hair. Surrounding that hair bulb we have the root hair plexus, which are nerves, these nerves right here. Then we have hair papilla, which is this little indentation where the vasculature can go into the hair. Then we have layers of the hair going from inside to out. We have the medulla in white, the cortex just outside of that, and then we have the cuticle. This is a little confusing because it's the layer that surrounds the hair shaft. So if this were pointed at and called a region, this would be the hair shaft, and if it were called a layer, it'd be the cuticle. And then we have the internal root sheath right here and right here. We have the external root sheath in yellow here and here, the glassy membrane in light blue, and the connective tissue sheath in purple.